so um the holy spirit is a counselor when he came as the father and told me my mother loved me and i have no father I'd been going to a counsellor. Now, she wasn't even Christian because I was trying to work through and I'd sort of lost my first love a little bit. And it was it was meant to be, of course, in the Lord, but I wasn't really... Um, the, my issue was my mother and my sister. They were the things I was discussing in this counselling. And it had manifest as a Christian with uh, me, and I hid this from my husband, um, binge eating wheat mix because I used to be alone when I got home, and I'd we only had we had very little food in the cupboard, but we'd always have wheat mix, and I used to eat too many wheat mix, like twelve. But now I was eating wheat mix. I had two small children, three, but two babies. And I was overeating, but I was overeating wheat mix. And I um had I had to go to Weight Watchers because my husband said I was fat. He didn't say that, but he just said I've paid for you to go to Weight Watchers. There's a meeting tonight. Nice. And I went and I wanted to, because of my, I just went. I don't think I consciously did it. And over, I was breastfeeding, still breastfeeding, and he said this, he did this. He never gave me anything, but he paid for this. He didn't pay for it, he, borrowed, he used to take money off his mummy. And he used his money, he kept his money separate. If I ever had an expense like a registration that was big, he would borrow it to me, give me a spreadsheet and take the money off as I paid it back 5 or $10 a week. But this was a shout. He was shouting me. And it was expensive, $15 a meeting. And in six months, I lost 26 kgs and it launched me confidence-wise from being an at-home mum um, to wearing a business suit, a briefcase, and administering, eventually, not ministering, what you call it? I was just, I was a lecturer running meetings in the city uh, of Christchurch, in the city to the businesswoman at lunchtime. And then I ran some meetings in a gym and then I also run some meetings at Bishopdale, which is a very high decile area, city, part of the city. And I had the key in the hall and I had staff and they were back to back, like two meetings. And I had merchandising and I did the money. We didn't have computers. I just banked the cash and, you know, I gained a lot of confidence. And they were the best meetings in Christchurch. I had... They uh, like they were like hereditary in terms of the leaders had left and I got them and they were good meetings when I got them but when I had them they grew to the greatest meetings in Christchurch. I'm not skiting; it's a fact. And the best thing about Weight Watchers is the meetings because what I noticed when I went to the meetings was that people, what I saw people being honest for the first time about their shame. I was never honest in terms, I never told people that I started bulimically vomiting my wheat bags. When I started Weight Watchers, I started vomiting it up because I was concerned. But over time, especially after the Lord had said, that I had no father, it all stopped and I was healed from bulimia. I could have I could have suffered that my whole life. So he undone that process and, and I was totally healed and I never had rejection again over my parents and I needed to not, I stopped going to counselling. I went there and I told her 
what the Lord had said. She wasn't a Christian, and I said, this is my last session. I never did it again. Well, now my pastor, Debs, was a Christian counsellor, and, and she was working with the Holy Spirit with this lady who did this doctorate, right? And at the time, the Lord had said nothing to me, but I had had some words for that for that my pastors when I was there. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the words because they're significant. I didn't understand them at the time. I had a dream about Debbie having a womb with two twins in it, and one twin consumed the other twin. And I told her about it. One twin was weak and sickly. And the other one was getting stronger. And she said that when she was pregnant with her older boy, you know, the perfect boy. And I related to it because I felt like I had a perfect sister and I was like the other brother. <coughs> she said that she believed that she was carrying twins and that the boy that she gave birth to consumed the other twin. I think she may have had a scan. So that was really as far as that word went, but we know what it means now, do we not? You wait till you hear the end of this testimony. Lord, I'm... I'm I, this is a testimony for you to do what the Lord tells you. Make yourself a fool for Jesus. Because it's for his glory. So, my husband said he wanted to go to another church. So I had to leave there. And he wanted to go to a more conservative church. We know where people didn't have earrings in their noses. He wanted to go to Elam Church. And I'd been saved in Elam and it didn't matter, I went, I did what my husband said unless the Lord said otherwise. So I was, we were going to Elam Church and we shifted away and I lost contact with those pastors. But one day I was um, woken with a word for Debbie. And I drove to the house and I gave it, I knocked on the door. And this is what I said. Keith, her husband, answered the door. Now, one thing about Debbie, and I don't even think it's important, but when they were Christians, they had a car accident and she had damage done to her spine. And she's one of those people who has so much prayer but and things get better and can she, she said she felt the Lord healing her, but she always stood with a stick. And um, I know now that she's in a wheelchair. And um, But at this stage, she was standing, from what I believed. But um, And she was a Christian counsellor. She was registered. And she was a pastor. And they were still running the church, I believe. I knocked on the door. Keith answered. And I said, Keith, the Lord given me a word for Debbie. I didn't say any more to him. I didn't even catch up with him. And he said, oh, yes, yes, listen. You know, they had a respect for me. But I'm pretty sure he didn't respect this word. I said to him, the Lord said that she's in adultery. The Lord said that she's in adultery. And he was uh, very gracious. And he said to me, well, Debs is in burnout at the moment. And she's in Dunedin at like a retreat. And I would say it was like a psychiatric retreat. Not that she was, I don't think she was crazy or nothing. She was just, she would, she's the sort of person that, she knows that people need to seek help and guidance and she needed to seek help. So she was getting ministered to in some type of retreat situation. We're probably Christian. 
burnout. You know how many pastors have burnout? Because they do it in their own strength. I'm, I was surprised because with the Holy Spirit, it's not tiring. What I do is not tiring. It gives you, it's his strength. So burnout is when you do it in your own strength. So that's what she was doing, obviously. So that's one telltale sign. It's not God if you're in burnout. I'm telling you that now. But he said she was at a retreat. And um, he said she does have a friend there. But like she, he must have said a male friend. Like he thought about it said but you know it's a platonic it's a friendship and I wasn't assuming anything I was just bringing the word and I said oh, she, he said I don't believe she's an adultery so he basically said it's a false word he was not my pastor anymore so he wasn't going to pastor me on it, it wasn't a rebuke or anything but I, I just I said well I just had to say what I'd heard from the Lord and I hope she's um back with you soon and then I left and I never thought about it again <coughs> until the Lord woke me up and told me to have this party for Amy where the glory was going to fall on the 20th of May and I was thinking about who to invite and I was I sought the Lord I said what about Keith and Deb's Lord and I had a dream now, we used to go and have meetings in the house, and it was in the room, in this dream I saw. She used to have her counselling room was in the other bedroom on the opposite side. That was her counselling room. Well, in this dream, the room that we used to fall about in the Holy Spirit and laugh and have joy and prophetic words, now had a big desk at the end of it where the window was, a big desk. And she was standing there and the Lord said, "All I, I don't know if he said anything, I just knew that what she was doing was the unforgivable sin. She was exploiting the Holy Spirit. She was using the Holy Spirit for merchandise, it's why Jesus turned the tables up when he was the angriest ever, righteous anger. It's the the real only real picture that we have of the Lion of Judah when he came as a lamb, is when he did that to the because they were buying and selling outside the temple in the holy place. That was what the Lord was talking about. That was the adultery. It wasn't physical adultery. That was the adultery. So they weren't going to make it and they didn't get an invite to glories, to the glory hut. No, not the glory hut, to Amy's birthday. I, that's what I knew. But I, but the Lord has assured me that Keith's going to be okay. Isn't that wonderful? Like, the thing is that there's two in the bed and they're not two men. It's a, it's a man and a woman in the bed. One's taken and one leaves. One, one stays behind. Well, Keith's taken. I'm not saying. Yeah, it's like if yeah, Keith's taken and Deb stays behind. So what are you isn't it hard to know that? Anyway. I think before I had the dream, I'd already gone to their house. And this is the only the second time I'd seen their house since been to their house since I left the church. We're talking nearly 12 years, 15 years, 15 years since I'd seen them. And here I am at their house, giving out these invitations. 
Well, I knock on the door and they're not home. Now, one of the things that happened with these two boys, and I wasn't first-hand witness, but the one that was um, not as perfect as the other one that had been a twin, he got cancer. But before he got cancer, he had a baby. And he called his baby Alex. And he had this baby, um, might have been outside of wedlock with this large girl. So they've had their trials, but I know he had a baby. And, um, when I knocked on the door, it was this baby that answered the door. <laughs> and the boy's name was Alex. Like, the, the two brothers. I'm pretty so, sure the boy's name was Alex. You know, the blonde boy and the dark boy, Deb and Keith's boys. The one that had cancer that died. Did he die? Oh, I'm not even sure if he died. He may have survived it. I don't think it matters, but that was his son. And his son was using the same name, whether it had been his middle name, but he introduced himself as Alex. When I saw him, he was identical to his father because he was the same age. That's how long it had been. And just, it was like Loki. It was time and me being who I am. I thought I was talking to him. And it sort of slowly dawned on me that this is his son. And anyway, I just said, is your mum and dad here? I used to know them at church, and he was so lovely. He let me go in to the house, and he took me into the lounge, and he said, oh, no, they're, um, they're in, a, in, I don't know where they were, maybe Rarotonga or on some holiday. He said, I'm looking after the dogs, and he seemed to live there. And, <coughs> and he had a friend with him who was around his age, they were only about 20 odd. And as I was talking to them, I realised his friend went to Polytech and Marty, my husband, he knew Marty and Marty had been his tutor. He'd done car painting. So he knew Marty and um, the he was... I think Alex knows about the law, you know, from his parents, but the other boy wouldn't. And I said to them that I was having a party for my daughter and um, that I invited them. And I didn't invite Keith and Debs. Of course, they were away. And they said they would come because I had that, you know, they knew who Marty was and they thought it sounded great. They didn't arrive either. But um, the Lord has them on my heart for something in Christchurch. Now, the reason why I mentioned all that, is it's important. It's about the Holy Spirit as our counsellor. So the scriptures say that no man would teach you, need teach you, the scriptures, that no man need teach you what love is. You that it's the Holy Spirit that will heal you, right? I can stand, I can bear the truth that I'm not loved now because I have, because I know what love is. Does that make sense? That's why all of you don't understand you're in a delusion about love because you can't bear the awful truth that they don't love you. You can't bear the awful truth that they don't love you. For Jesus said that the sons and daughters of God, you will know them. You will know them by their love for one another. That's the love that you need to search out. That's the family. Do you understand that? Now, when I was um, a 
when I um, was cast out of my husband's house because he wanted the divorce, I was going to the Elam church still, and that's where I met. I was with the young people doing salsa dancing. But um, the following Christmas is when the children were taken and I had a need. And the church, I don't know if I reached out to the Elam church, but the year before I'd been given a word, and I've mentioned it for the pastor, and this is the only other time I've been given a word for a pastor. His name is Clayton. And he was running probably the second biggest church in Christchurch, New Zealand. And in this vision, I saw ghouls, three. I knew there was three because there was three coffins above the reception in the church. And it was a literal dream in that church, but I'm sure that they weren't literally three coffins up there. But one was open and a ghoul was climbing out of it. And I told him this. And he was very gracious. And I could did the old thing, well, put it on the shelf if you want. Now, I invited him to Amy's birthday. Did I? No, I didn't. But I looked him up after I got back from the glory hut because he's one of the pastors that the Lord had me put on my back and I didn't know what happened to him after I left. But what happened the following year is this. Part of the affidavits that my husband wrote was that I go to strange churches and he mentioned a church called uh, Shekinah Glory. Now, Shekinah Glory is the church where I met my husband, Marty. Because when I was cast out of my home and I resigned from a teacher, I went to... Well, the reason why I went to another church other than Elam was because one of the first things that happened in the court case is I needed my pastor to support me that I wasn't in a cult because my husband said I was in a cult. But they were just, you can hear the churches I go to, they're just normal churches. Um, and Shekinah Glory was mentioned because that was one of the churches that I went to because I had no church anymore because my pastor... His name's Clayton. Clinton, his name's Clinton, was asked by my lawyer, and I personally asked him, to come and talk to the lawyer and tell them that it's, an, it's just a normal Pentecostal church. It's not a cult. Things are done freely. And to come, if called, because if you write an affidavit, you may be called into court. To court. Well, he was called into court and he didn't show up. He did write an affidavit, but he didn't show up to court, which didn't look good. So I was looking for another church. I never talked to him about it. I just, at the time, I was, I was thinking, wow, man, everything is playing in to my husband's hands. Like, he's running the system. Well, he was. He's Abaddon. He's Bezelbub. He was running the system. It was playing into his hands, not mine. But I was seeking the Lord praying, don't you worry. And um, so I ended up just going to this church, Shekinah Glory. And I'd never been there before. And I'd never been there before. And that was the first time I met my husband. I said he was wearing a red Arsenal shirt with number on it. And I prayed for him. Following week, he talked to me gave me his number and it was after I'd knew about the adultery with my husband so I was a, I don't know I just I fancied him straight away like the Lord was moving on me that he was the man I was betrothed to I didn't want to tell him that I had planned to not tell him for six months and just go to dancing with him and I had a, a chaperone with me the chaperone tried to steal Marty off me 
And I thought, well, if he goes with her, he's the wrong person because she was a Christian who was offering her, her massages. Disgusting. She rang him up and she said, watch out for Lisa. She's looking for her husband. <laughs> of course I was. I was a Christian. I wasn't looking for a lover. Now, So when the Lord woke me up with the persecution that my daughter was doing with on Facebook and she was having a, a psychiatric episode apparently, I was, um, everyone on Facebook knew and I had some friends that had got tattoos from her who were Christians. And one lady, Diane, approached me on Facebook and Messenger and she said, look, you know, maybe you need to, you know, go back to church because at that stage we weren't you, we weren't going to church. You can sort of see why. And um, not that we were offended. We just felt like our relationship was direct with God. Because I'd forgiven everything. Oh, my husband was offended, but I wasn't. And um, I said, where do you go? She said, the celebration centre. Well, I hadn't been there since I was in my 20s. And I talked to Marty about it. And he said, well, I don't want to go, hun. So I went. And that's the church that I was going to. And that's when the Lord showed me some things. Reminded me of the dream. And the pastor had changed. Murray had handed the church to his son, Kelly, you know, like the Budweiser ad, Kelly, female rival. I already knew when that ad come up with Claire what Kelly meant because I looked his name up because he was one of the eaglets that went on to my back. So I believed at the time, and I think I, I think it's true that he's the pastor who brings the message where the Māori people walk out offended. It's up to him whatever that message is. The Lord is working in his life. <coughs> but I never knew when it was going to happen. But at the time when I went there, I was beside myself with agony over what was happening to my family, and I was just getting prayer. Uh, but I heard Murray share his testimony and I went up to him and I told him about the glory that I saw. And I approached Kelly once because I'd been fasting and my daughter rang me up. I, I approached him once. My daughter rang me up and she said, Mum, I need deliverance when I had been fast, uh, fasting. So I approached him after the service and I said, can we go to the, the Hill Morton and pray with my daughter? She wants to be delivered. And I said, it could be a wee bit dangerous because she shared with me that last time she was in, a Christian man was trying to pray for her. He was a psychiatric nurse and she said she started screaming that he was touching her. So we must be very careful with these things. Anyway, Kelly did the pastor thing. He said, this is something that we all have to meet as elders before we get together and do something like this. Well, the Lord rebukes him for that because that window closed. He, he does. So we are to walk into these places and do the work of Jesus without any hesitation. Do you understand that? So we, they're crippling us with these divisive processes, worldly processes. We must work by the policy of the church. We have a policy. It's world. It's the world. So enough of that. When I came back from the glory, I had a look at Clayton, Clinton, and the Lord had reminded me of the word I'd bought him, but, you know, I didn't know what had come of it. 
Well, nobody wanted to tell me where he was. I couldn't find his church. And when I did find an Elam church, they said, look, just... I sat in the service and there was it was completely different flavour and different pastor. I talked to the two people, one person on reception. They said, well, go on Facebook. He's on Facebook, then you'll know what he's doing. That's all they said. They didn't even want to say it. <laughs> And I couldn't get Facebook on my phone because I didn't have enough internet. So I didn't find out when I was there. But I witnessed to a children's church leader when I was there. I told them a lot of things. And I said that, he never told me about Clinton either. I said that Clinton is going to be used in Christ church. And he never told me about what was happening to Clinton in the years in between when I saw him last. I went on Facebook. I'm just going to summarise what's happened. He went through the earthquakes in Christchurch and I saw some uploads on Facebook where people were just saying what a wonderful church pastor he was. He was at the hospitals. He was there for everyone. He had a wife and children. He was a wonderful pastor. And really, he, he ran a... He was very clever. He ran a rate... He, he ran a radio show. He was um he had two jobs. He was um a radio announcer and he'd witnessed to um a man who's quite famous in New Zealand. And that man went to an alpha course and joined the church and that you know, when you get a celebrity it's a bit like bloody um um Oh, the one in, I don't, I said the Lord won't even let me say its name. The one in Australia, the Hill Song, which was wonderful in the 90s. The music was so anointed, but yeah, no more. And you can listen to that old music, I believe. God is in, God is in the house. You can listen to that music. It was before everything went terribly wrong do you understand you need to be discerning you can't throw the baby out with the bath water for goodness sake this man is in Australia in a homosexual relationship running a flower shop and he's still a Christian but he's not a pastor that's what happened to Clinton. And he left. He must have come out of the closet in front of the whole church, left his wife and children, lives over there. He's still a good father. 